transportation was so deeply intersectional with all the stuff we care about. It was it didn't take us very long at all to recognize that transportation greatly impacts 
um, economic justice, climate justice, racial justice, social justice, it really has tremendous um, influence over all of the work that we were, that we cared about in our office. So we really started to dig in on the ways in which we could um, merge those interests with the Bureau of Transportation. And we were lucky enough to have um, a director like Chris Warner and some really awesome PBOT staff who were already really there and kind of recognized the same things that we did. And so one of the first things that we um, started to work on is what you've now come to know as the Rose Lane Project. Um, it started out as a conversation with our office in Peabot asking, what are we doing about bus only lanes and how are we going to, you know, improve the public transit system. And at that time, we had a few kind of corridors picked out and some small time pilot projects, but Commissioner U. Daly uh, recognizes the very urgent climate crisis that is looming upon us and um, we decided to go really big and bold um, with that project. I don't want to talk forever, but I do want to say one thing. I know Art Pierce um, from PBOT came here and kind of presented on the Rose Lane project, but I wanted to talk a little bit about what we are doing to help identify what that project looks like and why. And as you probably know, transportation is so much about data and modeling and numbers and all of that kind of stuff. What does congestion look like? How do, what do delays look like? Um, but sometimes it gets kind of far afield of the people that it's intended to serve. And so we really wanted to bring a sense of equity to the Rose Lane project. Um, in fact, I see Tristan here from Bus Riders Unite. He's kind of hard, sorry to call you up. But, um, we created a um, transportation justice advisory panel internal to our office that helps advise us on what the Rose Lane project looks like. And one of the key ways in which they've already changed the project is they were the first to see some of the draft maps um, that we were putting together. And those draft maps really centered around where are the greatest delays in, in traffic, what does congestion look like, how can we get the most number of people through um, the most congested areas. And what we heard from our internal advisors, these are community partners with deep equity lenses, um, said, what are our people-based goals? Like, how are we actually changing the lives for people? And so we really dove a little deeper into what does that mean? So we identified some um, better off measures that help us frame the Rose Lane project in a way that actually transforms how people live and work within the city of Portland. Uh, the top example of that, our top primary goal is to make sure that um, the average commute time for the average black commuter is comparable to the average white commuter because the census tells us, data tells us, that the average commuter who is black spends an additional 10 minutes a day in traffic um, commuting to their work and home. And so we, that is an entire work week in a year. And so we want to level out that playing field because commute times are the single biggest factor that help people out of poverty and into economic opportunity. And we deeply believe that when we approach transportation projects and transportation systems that benefit not only people of color, but our most vulnerable populations first, everyone else is better served. So I'm happy to engage with anyone more directly. You can contact me on official channels if you want to learn more about all of the work that we're doing and details about the Roselands or just details about our equity work in general. And thanks again for inviting me. Thank you. Hi everybody, I'm Chris Warner. I'm the director of the Portland Bureau of Transportation. Uh, I have been at the city for I think about uh, seven years now. Uh, I started out uh, actually in City Hall in uh, Commissioner Nowick's office. I was his chief of staff. I've been doing transportation policy though for many years. I worked for Governor Kulongoski for eight years doing transportation policy. I worked for Congressman DeFazio back in DC uh, when he was on the transportation committee. So I was his LA for the transportation committee during the minority then. He's the chairman now. So which we were chairman then. Uh, and so I've, uh, I've really spent my professional life uh, doing transportation. So we at Peabot, um, as you probably know, we are the uh, transportation authority for the city of Portland. We have 48 miles, lane miles of road. We have all the street lights, all the street signs. Uh, we own the streetcar, we own the tram. Uh, we own, uh, I think 156 bridges. Uh, they're not the famous ones, but there's a bunch of bridges that you don't uh, actually see very often. Uh, the Vista Bridge probably is the biggest one we see, but most of the, the bridges across Willamette are owned by either the county or the railroad or 
or ODOT. Uh, and so we, uh, so when there's potholes, we out, we're out there, we have the crews that do that. We have about a thousand employees. Uh, we have uh, basically six divisions where we do a lot of the maintenance work. We also do parking enforcement. We do, we run five smart park garages. So we really have everything that you touch in transportation basically goes through Peabody. And then as Jamie was talking about, you know, we're trying really hard, uh, even though we're not the, the bus system, uh, the buses have to go on roads. And so we really work in coordination with, with uh, the commissioner's office, but also with Primat to make sure that people can get around safely in the city. So there's three real uh, strategic goals we're working on right now. One is just working with our assets. We have uh, almost $13 billion worth of assets in the city of Portland, and we really have not been investing in those. So uh, what we're trying to do is really make some good decisions in terms of how we're investing in those assets. We have over $200 million a year in deferred maintenance on our assets. So we've got a long ways to go in terms of trying to get those assets up to where we need. So that's one of our strategic goals. We're also, uh, we need to be about safety. Uh, as you know, uh, I don't know if you know, but it's been a, a really hard year for safety in the city of Portland. We've had, I think, over 40 people that have been killed uh, on the streets um, and on the, on the roadways. So uh, we are a Vision Zero City. We're working very hard to make sure that the, that the city is safe. And so a lot of this, we'll talk about the transformation of some of the roadways and hopefully we'll be out of that conversation tonight. But safety has really got to be the, the guiding star for most of our work. And then the other really is just getting people moving and just growing and prosperous city. So one of the things you talk, I, you go to conferences around the country and they talk about congestion and what really congestion really means is a lot of economic activity and a lot of, a lot of people doing things. So that's good. Uh, we need to figure out ways for us to get around the city better, to get around the city uh, uh, safer, and to get around the city in a low carbon, with a low carbon footprint. So with those three, three strategic goals, we also have what really are the framework that we look at all the projects we're working on is really a transportation justice framework which deals with climate, with climate emergency, but also with really kind of dealing with the uh, really uh, systemic inequities in our system, particularly the racial uh, injustice in, in terms of how the, the city was made, about how gentrification has really uh, really impacted uh, citizens and residents of our, of our city. So uh, we really try to look at everything with a transportation justice lens because it's really important for us as we uh, try to really uh, unite Portlanders around kind of the, the values we have, we really need to have a transportation system that works for everyone. So I will stop there because I know that uh, we're ready to get on with the system. Yeah. So yeah. anyway, so Thank glad you. to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Howard, do you want to say something about some of the work that you've been doing at PMCA in terms of mobility? Like it's totally different from like architecture engineering world, but you're looking at it from a different like the artistic perspective as well. Sure, like, like Tui said, I took this class uh, last year and uh, loved it and uh, thrilled to be back with you here today. My, my talk last year was on fare-free transit and I learned a lot about that from, from Aaron and, and from Tristan as well. And um, uh, yeah, so I, I teach in the collaborative design MFA program at Pacific Northwest College of Art. We're not specifically focused on urban issues, but we're focused on facilitating uh, group processes. And so uh, through some facilitative processes, the students uh, develop this uh, foresight initiative around Mobility 2030, what mobility could look like 10 years from now in the city of Portland. And um, there was an exhibition last night at, at PNCA. Thank you. Um, we're going to launch into presentations pretty soon, um, but one of the things I want to tell you is some students are not doing presentations. Um, primarily, I, I think our lives also get really busy with other things, so it'll be okay if you want to um, still complete the, present, the project and present next year. You could do that. Um, one of the things that we that I brought back from years ago were certificates. And these certificates were nicely put together by Michael and signed by Jamie and Chris. And I have to send them myself. But um, we feel. Yeah, uh, the commissioner. Not the commissioner. I'm sorry. <laughs> but um, <laughs> in any event. <laughs> um, we feel that these certificates are earned by the project and the entire year of work. So if you want to finish the project and present, to me later or um, next year, next fall, then we'll hold on to these. But as the presentations come along, um, we'll present them to you kind of like a graduation with you. <laughs> um, I got an interesting phone call today from Earl Blumenauer, and I did not recognize his voice 
Um, I know it's faith more than his voice, but he's really excited. He regrets that he cannot be here because he's not in Oregon, but he's really interested in bringing this course to another level, meaning he, he wanted to bring this course to a group of an average age of 25 year olds and even younger. So I think we're gonna capture college students, more college students and more high school students and even middle school students. But I told him, I've totally revamped this course and the average age is not 55 anymore, but it has been <laughs> over the years. And I, I can look at the statistics, but I'm guessing the average age is probably much lower and we're able to capture people who are um, have very innovative ideas. And, that, and we're happy to have you here to listen to this. Um, one of the other things I want to bring up are the class evaluations. That's really important. I sent it out earlier today. Um, please complete them because we need them completed so that we have your feedback so we can follow through and change up the course over the years. Um, I'll be teaching this next year. year after, and we'll just see where things go. Um, but evaluations are important as well as a field trip. So we'll get started with presentations. The order in presentation is actually going to be the order of your last name. So it's in this list. So Rachel goes first. Um, and we're going to time it. I think I've talked about having this timed so that we can get through everybody. And it's one of the first times in which um, the director um, gets to see all of the presentations uh, versus, I think, previously, um, the previous instructor, Rick, had chosen one or two or three that he liked and then got to go. But I wanted to make this equal among everybody who has the opportunity to take it as a student and also take it as um, a resident um, so that we can hear them all. But it's going to be time. So three minutes. After the three minutes, I'm going to buzz you guys. And then we'll have like a five minute, a, a, sorry, a two minute Q&A. And then we'll do a quick transfer. So Sarah's going to be the one taking care of the transfers. I've loaded all your presentations on there already. Um, when we have one minute left, can yeah. you just like hold up a card or something just to let us know to kind of wrap it up a little bit so that it's not like three minutes are done. You know what I'm saying? I know. I know. Okay. <laughs> okay. Or just for me if no one wants to. Um, okay. but I thought it'd be really interesting to talk about it in this course because the homeless population interacts with our roadways in a much different way than the rest of the population does. Um, and so it's a broad question and I narrowed it down by selecting a site. And this is underneath an overpass where the, right before the Burnside Bridge over uh, Northwest First Avenue. And there's a max out there running in both locations, or both directions, on both sides of the street. And on both sides, generally, there's people camping on the sidewalk. So you've got 
things interacting, people, pedestrians passing through, coming down the stairs from the Burnside Bridge, and then you've got people waiting for the MAC stop, cyclists coming through, although not so much because there's really just a roadway for the train at that point. Um, and there's also a drinking fountain down there, which perhaps is why it's a location, but I think in general it's the the overhead coverage that you get underneath the bridge, and that's why you probably tend to see campers underneath these overpasses. Um, also, just to point out this location, there is already a number of social service organizations nearby, uh, Central City Concern, Portland Rescue Mission, and Mercy Corps. And underneath is this location here, and that's what I focus on. So I also wanted to point out that this is fully operational. I'm not saying this is a huge problem area here, but I was curious what could be done to make this a better experience for the people of using the transit and also to better serve the people who are living on the streets occupying that space. So the proposed solution that I have is that TriMet, who's operating the MAC stop there, partner with one of those social service agencies, or maybe one of the other ones in the city, Sisters of the Road, uh, Right to Survive, and Portland Rescue Mission, to provide some facilities <coughs> and services in this location to serve the people that are occupying the space, rather than doing some sort of exclusionary design to make it so that they can't be there at all. So this is pretty <laughs> difficult design problem. But, 30 seconds? Oh, wow, okay. Um, yeah, this is an example of a similar situation in Philadelphia where they actually provided this zone for services within their concourse of one of their subways. And then this is a little sketch of this area. So we're just running horizontally and this is underneath the overpass north-south. Um, just showing that you have zones here, uh, I mean, not just <laughs> zones for the okay. MAC station. And then one of the most interesting ideas, I think, is to incorporate the Saturday market by having vendors that could possibly be operated by some of the homeless population to give them some ownership of the space and also an opportunity to make money, um, that sort of thing. <laughs> Let's see what other ideas, the, the facilities, and then also one important thing to note about this overpass is that there's nothing under there on either side right now. It's just the road and then underneath this empty beside the parking lot. So uh, I talked to somebody at TriMet and he said that it might be difficult to build any permanent structures under there, but you could maybe do a temporary shelter or something that makes it so that the um, municipality can still access and do maintenance on this roadway. Um, probably know. Sorry, but you can um, read through the issues and we could do some, uh, some quick Q&A. Okay, so the issues that I thought of were having buy-in from TriMet to do this partnership. Um, having, like I said, use of the area under the overpass. And then some more just theoretical issues of, are you gonna end up displacing the people that are occupying this space if you change the use there? And then also will, if you have all these services provided here, will become too crowded and not function as it does now. Um, I know there's already some restrooms over there, but I don't know if they're functional and open like through the week. So I know like during Saturday market. Okay. They're, are they they're like in the Saturday market riverfront area? Yeah, it's about like 150 feet from the spot you're focusing on. Okay. So I just wonder if maybe like, because I assume they're probably not open throughout the week, but mm -hmm. that could be like a way to address the missing bathroom. Yeah, equipment. are they like public restrooms? Or they, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I've only really like used that restroom during the Saturday market hours. Yeah, the ones that I proposed were actually the Portland Blue, which 
Is that stop? Sorry if I missed this. Is that stop closing? I yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah, but actually, I talked to Sean. <laughs> yeah. Sort of. Sean said it probably isn't, but they went through. Yeah, that they went through a study about it and decided not to close that. They're making a deal with the Portland Saturday Market that if they can maintain it, they will consider keeping it open. So we are working on that right now. Did you talk to any of the providers like Sisters of the Road or Portland Rescue Mission about no, what they I wanted to do? Definitely did. That would have been really good. We have contact. Yes, we have contact. We have contact with Sisters of the Road and Rescue Survive. The other class I did. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, one of my favorite things from this class was when Steve Keller came and uh, he talked about the connection between entrepreneurs and transportation planners and how they have an ability to see things that don't exist. So uh, we're going to sort of take us on a journey of something that might not exist right now, but hopefully will one day. And you are all the sharks. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I'm saying. Welcome, Sharks. <laughs> We're looking for seed funding to help our school community improve the safety and health um, through our school streets idea. I'm Sam Balto. I'm the phys ed teacher at Cesar Chavez School in North Portland, and uh, we're going to present on this idea. So we have a problem. And this problem is traffic inducing traffic. There's too much traffic for Billy to walk to school, so we drive him. And let me tell you, as a teacher, as a crossing guard at the school, I see this constantly, how parents don't feel safe walking their children, so they drive them, which then, of course, makes it more unsafe, which gets more parents to drive. But there is always a child or multiple children who don't have parents who can drive them. So what do we do about them? All right, and this is sort of what I always think about is the children that don't have parents that can drive them are now in a more unsafe environment from this sort of vicious cycle. We've had a lot of successes. Um, I, we recently got an America Walk Community Change Grant, which we used to create this one of three uh, murals in our school parking lot, which is really, you know, help liven and beautify the school, sort of also get us, get our families to think about and our students to think about a parking lot differently and a crosswalk in another area outside of kindergarten classroom. And just this week, we started our first drive zone, which is an area which used to be a parking, uh, a parent drop off for middle schoolers, is now closed during 7, 7.50 to 8.05. And it is absolutely amazing. Today, there are middle schoolers who are just hanging out in the parking lot instead of being pushed off onto the sidewalk waiting while parents were idling for 10 minutes for the doors to open. It is, as a teacher, you know, it is absolutely amazing to see. Uh, we have three walking school buses for all our walk to school day events. Uh, our school recently won the America Walk, I mean, Oregon Walks uh, Weston Award, and uh, we've just had a lot of really awesome uh, partnerships. Our solution is an idea out of London and Europe called School Streets, so we want to call it the Chavez School Streets, and this is an idea where the roads around the school are closed during drop-off and pick-up. And just to sort of, you know, really important that this is a community process with you know my families and the neighborhood and all of this so I didn't want to get like too far ahead of things but sort of thinking that um, oh yeah the pointer's working uh, sort of creating as a teacher you know you want to make the movement of children and families as clear and obvious as possible so we want to you know I think my initial thought was to close down North Willow Street which is right in front of the school our parking lot, hopefully, uh, which is one-fifth of our entire school space, 
would be closed during drop off and pick up. So right now it's just this zone, but maybe a whole parking lot could be closed during that time. And um, just sort of have some at a Saban school in Northeast Portland, they have do not enters with like plants or bump out sort of thing to make some of the crosses shorter for families that are walking. And by doing this, we would sort of be creating a safe walk for all of our students and all of our families and creating a strong learning community is what's you know the utmost importance and having our children being able to calmly walk to school really creates this you know amazing experience for them and I think this idea of an entrepreneur being able to see thing that doesn't exist when we talk about equity of our you know for everyone we need to be focusing on our students and how do we you know have our students see something that right now doesn't exist, but because their voices and their concerns are heard, in their time that they are at school, they are going to experience this change. And so our children are worthy of every opportunity to thrive. Shark, are you in or out? <laughs> Thank you. There's been a lot of safety improvements that have come by in this, you know, the past couple of years, and it's funny how the news fixates on, you know, one thing. It's been a long community process, but I think, you know, I really have a strong passion. You know, as a phys ed teacher, kids don't get 60 minutes of phys ed or recess every day, so walking or biking to school is a great way to, you know, have that built-in, you know, physical activity. But you have to have the infrastructure changes for families to feel safe. Parents love the crosswalks, love the speed bumps, and they really feel hurt about that. So thank you. We were at the Western Awards, so congratulations. Thank you. No, I know someone famous. <laughs> Can you go back to the map? Yeah. So do you have like the kids out with the crossing guard flags at yeah. Hereford and so um so we actually this year is the first year we've had crossing guards, and that's because they've added about adding new crosswalks here and we have them every day in the afternoon but never in the morning because families and staff just don't feel like North Willis is safe for children to be out. We do have three crossing guards. We have like I'm one of Ms. Hazel who's here is absolutely amazing. Um, you know there's three of us that help cross and there's a lot of weird dynamics around drop off and pick up. But basically, I think the thing that would be really cool about the school streets idea is if you close off the parking lot, close off North Willis, you're sort of creating this like 150 foot idling free zone. And that just like all around families, you know, to just sort of calmly walk in. But right now, you know, hopefully as a school, we can work on the parking lot. You know, we don't need PBA, we just need a work, you know, parents need a voice, the concerns, and we sort of work with the principal in the district, but we go out, but then we still have parents who drop off right at the front door, um, which is still a ton of idling and everything. Um, so my kids go to Beach, which is oh, yeah. to Cesar Chavez, and um, I've tried to get people engaged on is similar issues, and so I'm curious, like, are you, were you the person who made this happen mostly, or did you, like, who else did you have to get on board? Because I can't get anyone yeah. interested. I think, you know, as a phys ed teacher, I feel like I'm, or as a teacher at the school, I'm kind of like the, you know, Trojan horse. I can kind of sneak in, build all the relationships with the kids. And children are incredibly persuasive. So, you know, you sort of create those relationships with the kids, promoting walking and biking. The family see that sort of positive energy coming. You know, they want to get on board, but it's really, you know, I think one of actually the, one of the most touching like, things that, that happened to me in my career um, was I was presenting about the drive school at one of the PTA meetings, and um, one of the moms was like, Coach Balto has always looked out for what's best for our children. I support this idea. Like, that's all she said. I was like, okay, yeah. thank you. And now that mom has been there every morning this week, handing out flyers, talking to parents, and 
it's you know as a parent you just kind of like start small and sort of like how you know Peabot's kind of chipping away at the like bus lanes it's sort of that same sort of thing you know first we closed first last year we closed this entrance then we closed these two entrances permanently so like we have ballers that we put up and it's just sort of chipping chipping away and the idea is that we can get people to think about the space differently and sort of going off the leadership class for younger kids i'm thinking about creating some sort of leadership class to sort of look at the parking lot which is so much of our school space and maybe doing a um deep project or doing like a better box better blocks you know like pop-up or a parking day to get like us to think about a parking lot differently I really quickly I was wondering did you if this was implemented where or what we have already done the extra where do the cars go now these cars like, or are, how have you noticed the the change in the drop-off parents with cars yeah and how that back does it back up does it like, do they go to side streets? I mean, day one, like, uh, it was a little crazy and it was icy that day, oh, but that's true. families true. are really starting to realize that, so sorry, if you look on this side, so kindergarten through second grade drop off here and middle school drop off on this side. So parents, you know, drop off, but then their kid walks through a grassy field with, you know, trees. So like, they don't need to go to the front door. We're here, since parents <clears> have the opportunity to go to the front door, that sort of traffic inducing traffic, they're like, naturally the very like I'm gonna drop my kid off at the closest point. But so when you sort of take that closest point away from everyone and you're saying, hey, you can drop off here now. And I had, you know, like a first grader and her, you know, her older sister, and this mom like doesn't always drive, you know, like the safest through the parking lot. She just dropped okay. Uh basically <laughs> like walking through the parking lot. It was really amazing that like the mom speeding through, you know, the sister and the, you know, her older sister were walking through like nice and calmly. So excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, my project is related is basically with the goal of creating safer crossings uh, on Southeast Powell adjacent to Preston Park. This is as you probably know, Powell is one of the more dangerous heats in Portland. It's on Peabot's high crash network. Each one of those orange dots uh, for about a mile west of Foster uh, is a place where someone has been killed in the past decade. And that's relevant because there are schools on either side of this. We have a K-8 Jesuit school just on the north side of Powell. Preston Elementary at the south side, Preston Park and Swimming Pool. Also, uh, Creston Annex Head Start uh, daycare right here. And as I'll get back to, a neighborhood greenway right on this one. So the hazards for uh, students going through this, I'll get to. This is actually a neighbor of mine. Uh, has a five-year-old kid who's a kindergartner out there, and she asked his classmates how they got to school and what would make it easier for them to walk and bike. Um, and the great majority of the students do walk or bike because uh, it is a school that serves that neighborhood, basically Foster Powell, Preston Kenilworth, and uh, half of Richmond there. So roughly half of the, that area is crossing Powell to get to school. Um, the dominant answer from, from those kids and families was that safer road crossings would, would make it easier for them to walk to school. Or often. This is my neighbors. She's pushing them up the hill as she, <laughs> as she rides, rides up there to get to this intersection, which I'm going to talk to. Um, the first hazard is just the speed of traffic here. It's marked at 35 miles an hour. Cars routinely they go 40. Sam and I both have our speed guns, as we discovered. Um, <laughs> um, and there's no, there are school speed zones on the, the neighboring side streets, which would be 20 mile an hour zones any, in any case of this one, but there is not. Oh, uh, this is the street that has both the, uh, the greenway actually running, oops, 
greenway running around. Here. So the challenge is that this intersection with both car and that, if you wanted to walk across this intersection with cars, because all cars at this intersection are turning, they would be capable of pulling into the crosswalk. If you're biking and trying to pull up to go through the intersection, likewise, you have cars pulling up next to, to you, so bad visibility, especially if you're five years old and it's tall. You also can't go straight across the intersections because they are closed to pedestrian traffic. Um, this is the, the dog leg where 32nd and 30, or 42nd and 43rd cross column. And so to get across from this side of the sidewalk to the other side, you were headed to Preston Park. You actually have to make two crossings, first cross 43rd, then cross Powell. Uh, I've timed it, and that takes about two and a half minutes for me and I block legs. The wait time just this leg is about a minute and 45 seconds. As you can see, not all students necessarily wait for that entire time. So another source of conflict. Um, as far as what we can do about this, here's a map of the area. And in some ways it's a tough spot. Uh, the thing that I think you'd ultimately want to do is really re-engineer the whole street. Powell is terrible in a lot of respects. And unfortunately that's, you know, an inherently expensive project, controversial project, and so it's not going to happen uh, probably until Peabot gets jurisdiction of that street from, from ODOT. In the meantime, Peabot has done some more successful things with other streets. Here's Holgate, a little bit south of Powell. Uh, you couldn't do exactly this at Powell, because you don't have the parking lanes to play with, but this is where they have sort of semi-protected bike lanes. Let's keep, keep going for a little bit. Um, so the good news is I talked to Peabot, and they actually earlier this, this spring agreed that this was a good idea, put in a, a work order to do bike lanes at this spot. Uh, the problem is that they have to deal with ODOT because it's a, it's a state highway. And ODOT will not allow no turn on red signs from the cross street without a specific engineering study that demonstrates that this is a safety improvement. Meanwhile, the scenario here is this is the status quo. Um, this is where there would be a no turn on red sign if there were a bike box. And the background we know is that allowing turns on red make intersections much more dangerous for people walking or biking. So if anything, I would say that ODOT's uh, burden of proof is backwards on this. Like our default assumption should be that the safest thing to do is to close those, those red on reds and justify when we want to do it the other way. Same deal with speed. Uh, I just got some more emails back today from, from ODOT about the possibility of a school speed zone. Um, which apparently there was until 2004. They changed the rules, removed the speed zone, and uh, part of the reason that, and, and actually a few years after that, when they raised the speed limit on power as a whole from 30, okay. This was a quote from a guy at Peabot. <laughs> uh, about, about the way we set speed limits, basically. <laughs> One thing I would just add is that we are trying very hard in order to um, to work on Powell, but as, as you yeah. noted, it's it's been difficult. Challenges. I mean, just around even 26th and 21st in terms of some of the bike lane that was there in front of Cleveland High School, they made us take it out. So uh, yeah, so it's been it's been a challenge, but we'll continue to. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Oh, we're okay. Hi everybody, I'm Caroline. Um thank you for starting with my talk and we're excited about it. <laughs> so um, I can really focus on the thing of activism. It has a really long and interesting history um, of activism. And I think that in one intersection that really was missed. So I'm gonna talk about that a little bit too. So this is North Bethlehem right here. 
And under this part is the St. John's Chuck strategy plan. So there was a lot of theft on the street. A lot of the neighbors got really, really upset. So they implemented this plan, but I think that they really um, missed a really good opportunity with a couple of intersections over here. Um, each of the circles is a death, and um, these are injuries, and then specifically right here that I'm going to focus on. Um, North Bethany is surrounded by a ton of schools. I think we can all agree on the fact that our kids have a right to walk to school safely, to back to school safely, and um, this project like really affects me personally because I do work at Rosa Parks, which is a Chavez school. And uh, my kids aren't able, you know, we aren't able to take them all the like this. And um, a lot of the people that have been killed have been kids. So in 2017, on the eve of a town hall talking about the street, somebody was killed. A 13 year old was struck and seriously injured on this road. Um, another person was hit and killed in April. And a 15 year old was seriously injured in 2016. So, Kiva was like, all right, this is messed up. What are we going to do about it? Uh, they created the truck, the uh, truck strategy plan. So the original truck route is supposed to go this way. But what's happening was trucks were going straight through North Bessonen. Over 500 trucks per day were going on the road. They were going at really fast uh, speeds. And uh, neighbors got really, really upset about that. One of the things that I have trouble understanding is the prioritization of how the truck strategy plan was built. The number one thing was improving the design freight route, and then the number two thing was using traffic climbing and safety in different projects. Now, I understand that both these things are important, but I would urge PBOT to put the second one first, in my opinion. Um, now I'm going to introduce the Citizens for a Safe and Attractive North Precedent Street. This is an advocacy group of neighbors and parents that really were riled up about what was going on. And actually, the person that founded this, her name is Donna, and she took this class in 2002 and actually got a lot of the things that she wanted done. So I just want to kind of give a clue to her. So, these are some of the things that's going to be improved on North Pleasant Street. Um, they have been a bit delayed, but I do want to. Is that the So they've done a lot of them. They could have been faster. So my focus on is so this is it, and this is what I want to focus on: North Pleasant and North Wall. What I want is this to be green. This is so unsafe to cycle through, and it's really scary. So my proposed plan is to put green in between that point of conflict, and also put bullard lighting um, at one of those crosswalks. Okay. Who would cycle on that? You know, it's like so scary. So what happened was they probably widened the street right here so that the trucks would go through. So the phase one of the project would be to stripe the green. Phase two would be to put white lines out here, just so that there's more of a visual barrier. And then phase three would be having um, some kind of like concrete barriers or potters. And then bullards here. So this is the Peninsula Shell Crossing. As y'all know, um, there's a lot of houses people that cross that area and it's extremely dangerous to cross. And uh, I think some bullard lighting would also really improve that area. Um, and some exciting news. So I've talked to, I spoke to some people from Peabot about this. Um, basically, we just have to write a neighborhood letter from the association, call that number, Peabot will do an assessment. But from what I've heard about P from Peabot is that they're saying that it's very feasible and if we keep going with it, it's likely to happen. So that's exciting. Okay, thank you. Thank you. You literally read my mind. <laughs> because, like that's where one of our walking school buses starts, and there's the apartments right across the street, and it's like so hard to get them. 
the kids because they would need to cross North Benson in some capacity. Yeah. And that turn onto North Wall is just so much extra. Yeah. Speed, so. Yeah. There's been two injuries there. Yeah. I'm on board. Cool. <laughs> What's up? Your sure. yeah. An insula trail bike crossing mm -hmm. that needs activated rectangular flashing. <laughs> I would be down, but I don't think that's super feasible right now. But we're going to talk about that after. They're putting them in all over town. They should do them. Do them soon. Caroline. What's that? Oh, uh, thank you. Rectangular thank you. flashing. Andrew? Like they have on 17. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm Andrew. Um, just want to be discussing how this particular exit off of four or five north can be more pedestrian friendly. If uh, there is a walk, uh, crosswalk right off the exit. So this is the sign of the exit. Um, we've been talking about equity a lot within this course. This is the, ex the equity met by met Metro. As you see within the title, I says for all because everybody uses this exit, no matter your color, your income, your your gender. This can use all modes of transportation. So this is where the exit is at. As you see, you got the white, you got the dark blue, and this is kind of like what equity is. So this also is a satellite visual. This is Sandy here. This is owned by Peabot. This is 205 North. Also here is a transit center, which is a Park Rose Sumner Transit. And the spot I'm talking about is right here. When uh, other close look, this is what it looks like when people coming off the, the exit. This is owned by ODOT. So ODOT owns a lot of the land off the major highways. And which, since they own the land they own all the maintenance and the ones that are circled is the stuff that really don't work that's not really very effective so as you see there's a pedestrian sign here just gives some awareness that you know pedestrians may cross there's two street lights that that do not work i'll show you more more visuals and also an interesting like traffic coming uh, signal here that really don't work, but then when I talk to certain um, like Peabot representative, they, they was like, um, in, um, they found it interesting that they have this device on only um, on an exit compared to entry or a highway. And this is a more of a closer look on how. Like that view, you're coming on. Once you get here, here's the crosswalk, and I will show more of a closer look as well. And the certain certain problems, like pointing out the street lights don't work, and the this ramp is not it's not up it's not up to code to ADA, and no more sidewalks. A huge barrier. Local jurisdictions is like, uh, who owns this property? Is it Peabody? Is it ODOT? What can we do to do this? Or is someone fix uh, Right here is a, a night vision of getting a little more closer look on what the problem. And you see the evening time, most the street lights don't work compared to other ones. And the since the street lights don't work, this is hard to see. Okay, uh, I'm going to be real quick. This is a more of a closer look of the ADA ramp, and also this is a possible solutions is that they can just really replace the existing street lights and light bulbs, 
and then also make this more AJ uh, up to code, but I know that's a lot of money because concrete is a lot of costly, a lot of money. A lot of money. But so something that's more cost efficient is, is really just putting more uh, the building more uh, so before the crosswalk. Fence the building tooth is here, not here. And then also they can even just push some like a uh, crosswalk visible so people can be aware that they're going to cross. And as you see, there's a little s s s sign here that gives the awareness of people that are driving on Sandy that there's going to be merging. And benefits, this is really at equity within transportation development because you've seen the mapping there isn't quantified that this is an equitable area. It's all communities, all people, you know, no matter your demographics. And also it's right by a transit center, which means a lot of people like their walk there or even park and ride. And a lot of people from Vancouver, Washington uses that transit center as well. And this is a good way for transportation system to be preventative compared to always reacting to fatal crashes because no one has died at that inter at that point yet. But hopefully that don't happen if change improves. Thank you and any questions. <laughs> Why is it so difficult to get the two existing street ramps fixed? To me, it seems like that would be a maintenance request rather than a capital improvement project. Yes, I agree. I noticed, um, I think it's, to me, uh, if I drive around the phone often, um, I notice on a lot of ODOT property, there's a lot of like, <coughs> I know I reported it to ODOT with their like online safety reporting reporting and we will see how small it takes for that to happen. But I do I do appreciate it. Any other questions, comments? Yeah. I know on that strip or close to it, they added a pedestrian island and some ADA crosswalks, like before the bridge. Yes, sir. Is that ODOT or PBOT? That's PBOT. So, Sandy owns. <laughs> I mean, Peabot owns that part of Sandy. They added a, a other one where, like, for Prescott, like on 85th, I think it is, uh, which is a crosswalk. And also, they're making the other more like in, uh, enhanced the pedestrian crossing by the Prado, which is on Sandy too, but that Peabot. So that particular part I'm talking about, it was really like about oh, was Peabot. I know it's a whole lot, but it's a lot of politics that goes in there. And you were. I guess the only thing I would say um, is uh, thank you for, for you know, I'm very familiar with this intersection as well. But one of the things I think we you might we might want to look at is whether or not we have people cross Sandy further down towards town as opposed to doing it right there where people are getting off the freeway because that is a it's very dangerous there. So maybe to figure out ways not to encourage people to actually walk on that side, but cross Sandy before you get there to be on the same side of the transit center. So, and then maybe having some kind of other crossing uh, down a little bit east. So, but thank you for bringing this to attention. This is really, uh, I, it, yeah, it looks terrifying. So. <laughs> All right, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Michelle Dewberry, and my project was to um, ask the Portland City Council to mark World Day of Remembrance. Um, the World Day of Remembrance was initiated in 2005 by the United Nations um, as an opportunity to put down the scale of economic devastation caused by those crashes. Um, worldwide, 1.35 million people die each year in crashes, and 
it's the leading cause of death for children under the age of 15 in the U.S. and in Oregon. Um, this is my story. Um, in 2010, my husband Eric and was pushing a stroller with my toddler son Seamus in it, and a careless driver struck them both. Um, my husband sustained minor injuries, and our son spent a night in intensive care, and he died the next day. Um, so this issue is uh, personal to me. Um, this was this is the excerpt of my testimony, um, and I I won't read it, but um, many of the things that I asked the Portland City Council to think about were things that I learned in this class, so I appreciate that. Um, particularly things that, um, things like um, lighting, that's, that's something I had never thought of before, so um, I appreciate that. Um, I was one of three people to testify. Um, this is the proclamation. Um, I'm, I'm not gonna read it, but it's in my presentation and you can go to the shared drive to find it. Um, so this is a picture um, from the day that, that we testified. So you can see the city councilors, the mayor, and in the center, um, it's me and three other parents who lost children and in Portland crosswalks. Um, and so the three women there, we, we all testified, and, and David, who's on the right, um, he was in attendance too, in honor of his daughter. Um, so our testimony was covered in the news. Um, they ran an excerpt on the TV and. Um, my testimony, and then Bike Portland did a big story about it. Um, and I put a link there to the Bike story, Bike Portland story. So, if anyone wants to make a, or try and get a proclamation, um, <coughs> the table, um, they're made at the discretion of the mayor, and um, they're issued to individuals and organizations who are seeking recognition of events, awards, remembrances, occasions that are value of or significance to the city. So basically you just submit a one page um, draft of whatever you want to say and there's more guidelines about how to word it and everything. Um, but it's pretty simple and pre pretty easy. Um, and I included the contact information in the office and you can get you more information. Um, the council was super um, compassionate and they everyone cried and um, they were really thoughtful in their responses, and so I appreciated that. Um, Mayor Wheeler, I don't know why he, um, he his response mostly was about like hiring more police officers. So I, I had to like follow up my email afterward and say like that's not what I'm talking about. Like I, I hope what they took away was that we need infrastructure um, way more than we need enforcement. Um, and then um, I just wanted to credit the street trust. Um, Jillian presented here, and she really did all the heavy lifting um, in terms of getting our um, testimony in front of the council. And um, she also kind of organized this work and talked with Washington family for six weeks, which is um, that's the group of us that um, gave testimony. So um, that's it. What would, what would World Remember, uh, Remembrance Day entail? What, what would that look like if we it's, had it's, it's a It's kind of a, it's, it's to raise awareness, really. So um, I, I think a lot of my activism, telling my story, it really is like it gets people's attention. And um, I've, I've passed an insurance with one bill in the Oregon State Legislature just by talking to people and telling my story. And so if I can do that, and I can do that with other parents who have been impacted, um, it, it's really powerful and, and you don't really even know like once you get in front of people and tell your story to leaders you oftentimes you don't know where that's going to lead but um, it's also something positive. So. It takes a lot of work. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mine is short and sweet. Um, I figured my classmates would have quite a lot to say, so I thought I'd keep it short. Um, mine is very focused. It's, uh, it's something that I, I see quite often. Um, I live in Northwest Portland, so I'm always kind of heading towards the waterfront, and 
this area in particular um, has always been on my mind. Uh, this is, so this area is the steel bridge, right under the steel bridge where uh, Gleason and Hearst uh, kind of end. There is a NATO, NATO cross, or NATO Parkway crosses here. Um, there is no crosswalk there at the moment, at the moment. Um, so I wanted to kind of research this and then see what the reasoning was to uncover. Uh, and you can see this is kind of the location here. Um, there were some improvements, uh, added bike lanes, uh, but there is no crosswalk from here to here from the, the streets to the waterfront. Um, yeah, so some things to consider uh, is kind of a peculiar, peculiar location uh, because it's kind of near the steel bridge, under the steel bridge. Um, and I understand that is steel bridge is owned by Union Railroad, is that Union correct? Pacific, yeah. Yeah. Union Pacific Railroad. Um, <coughs> ODOT has kind of the management of, of that bridge. Um, and Kiba obviously has uh, the roads here, so it's kind of like a <laughs> like a like a head butt of three way here. <laughs> <laughs> um, it is so there is a kind of a new uh, project that is that was started this year, uh, Better NATO Forever. So I wondered if the crosswalk that was going in here was part of Better NATO Forever, but it wasn't. Um, I think this has been, this, it's called, well, people call it the NATO gap because before, I'm not sure my dating, but 2013 or 2012, um, there was the bike lanes kind of ended here and then there was a gap from here to here, so they call it the NATO gap. Uh, so, but eventually Peabot filled that gap. Yeah. Was, yeah. Um, and a lot of people were very well, happy. And, oh, yeah, and, go ahead. Um, I, if you could go back for a second. Yeah. I think that that lane uh, onto the steel bridge has been closed as well. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah I do see there are some barriers now. That, um, that was part of the Rose Lane project in order to get the buses or the, the, to get the bus over the steel okay. bridge. Okay. Um, yeah, but I do notice um, when I'm going down there, typically walking down or walking the dog, jogging, um, meeting friends. Um, I do see there's a, quite a lot of pedestrian traffic across this way. If you stand there for five minutes, you'll see tons of people crossing. Uh, joggers, uh, people lugging suitcases, tourists, um, those who face homelessness. Uh, there is a day storage container uh, right across there. So it is very, that is like the quickest way to get to that. Uh, yeah. And the nearest crosswalks are 0.1 miles away each way. So they're, yeah, in both directions. So it's kind of like the most likely place for people to cross. The tourists who are crossing, when I turn around, there was a train. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. You yeah. never know how long that train is going to be. <laughs> We're turning on the boat. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so this was, this was the propo proposed plan by Peabot, um, and it did include the pedestrian crosswalk here. Um, everything else, as far as my knowledge, was completed except for the crosswalk, so I did inquire uh, to Peabot. I got an answer today from Timur, Timur, Timur. To more Endor, yeah, yeah. Uh, saying that they are aware of it um, because because it's close to the crossing of uh, the railroad here. There's kind of like a extra review that needs to be done before they put in the crosswalk. So is it? Is, I think it's it's in limbo right now, but they're <laughs> working on it. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, but yeah, hopefully there something comes of it. Yeah, um, uh, and then just some solutions I was trying to think of 
you know, it is a simple crosswalk, but, you know, small things add up to big things, especially when it comes to safety. Um, so, yeah, definitely, you know, installing uh, beacon, maybe motion activated beacons or push beacons, because um, it is particularly dangerous uh, crossing. Oops, sorry. So, as you can see in this picture, you know, if you're lugging something, there's kind of this. Uh, concrete barrier in between and that it is very, it slows you down. So I'm, yeah, so that's another danger, uh, either crossing with a bicycle or with luggage. So uh, just maybe, I don't know, maybe like a small island or something, but it is a very small piece of concrete. Yeah. So I don't, I'm not sure about that. Um, and I also looked at in-road light, lights. I'm not sure if that's, possibility, but it's kind of a, a thing for visibility, at least, for pedestrians. Another thing that could be implemented. Uh, yeah, and then this is where it will go. Hopefully, will go. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I have a question. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that um, it occurs to me is yeah. that a, a crossing in that location might be kind of unsafe, even if you built it up. Because at a specific time, when somebody knows that a train is coming across the bridge and it's about to get there and it'll close the roadway, people are really just going to speed through there. That's true. That's true. And the other thing is, when there is a train there and all the traffic is stopped, all of the, I used to live on the other side of that train track. Um, the only other way to get there if the train is stopped is to go around and then over the bridge, oh, yeah. which is awesome, but it's really hard to get across yeah. that road in order to get around and over the right. bridge. So improving it for people on bikes. Yeah, that's true. Thank you. Thanks. Good evening, everyone. My name is Juan Marley. Um, yeah, I'm new in the Grand Canyon, um, and I work with Mopano as a Chinese community organizer. So I, uh, I work with affordable housing GCC for a while, so I'm really concerned of, uh, about the transportation. Uh, that's why I'm here for this class, and I um, appreciate Mary and uh, this class made me uh, feel really connecting to the uh, <coughs> our community, and because I'm not really familiar with the Portland history, so uh, it's really helpful to like, improve my knowledge about transportation. Uh, my project today is JD Street in Mobile um, The transportation uh, problem I then identify is the JD Street uh, in East Portland is a very diverse immigrant community. Uh, very, uh, the people who live over there and work around is like usually driving a car. So right now the people uh, is like moving from an, an, another city. So uh, Traffic is really bad in uh, J District. So um, we know the mobility options like uh, ride sharing, bike sharing, and the scooter sharing has really uh, common in downtown area. So for the um, traffic, so and the ball balancing requirements, so we really think. Uh, J District has not been accessible to the recent of the J District to use the other options of the transit. Um, so I think everyone is very familiar with uh, J District. Is the area community building an uh, enormous development? So upon all, uh, the Asian Pacific American Network focus uh, is improving. That area, the temple area, uh, the long chain section and division. Um, so, all my life in America, I lived over there, JD6. So, I saw uh, the area. So, 
I didn't put any picture about uh, J District in my PowerPoint. So I think everyone maybe know about J District uh, because we are going to have a field trip uh, two weeks later to see some <laughs> just like a lot of Asian grocery and uh, small business around that area. So imagine the low income new immigrants in this that area, how they uh, comfortable to use their phone to connect in the uh, app, how they uh, without, I mean, with the language barrier, how they can like use the app to uh, use the mobile, uh, I mean, use the app to use the, um, like the different uh, mobility. So um, yeah. So the possible solution, uh, actually I uh, involved to this project in the Kano, and as the new mobility service provider expand their service in East Portland. Uh, so we, we create uh, the new mobility system and uh, in the last August, the August, a panel holds a planning meeting uh, with successfully involved from Metro Road City, City <coughs> Community Development, and by town climate and fly uh, share now and people as in uh, a panel of stuff. And we have some public education and outreach. Um, on August and September, we create Sakuram to teach uh, a lot of uh, senior uh, living in the complex Portland Manor in the uh, Portland Manor around like 200 Chinese uh, seniors to how to use the hot pad. Um, and the part also with people in uh, Rose CDC and Science recent of the Archers of 82nd for people transportation wallet and everyone can uh, 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 sign up for get like 300 something to try on the different uh, mobility in J District. So the perfect uh, solution, uh, the, uh, this is actually uh, kind of like the old one. I, I change a little bit later, <laughs> right? So um, the perfect solution uh, as yeah, <coughs> um, new mobile service provide and uh, expand their service in East Poland. And then we, uh, the cohort base, we have learning workshops and a panel new mobile rights radics to let me the people to try the different uh, mobile and in language to support. Uh, the key project uh, components in cool is policy support. I know a uh, metro transportation investment measure passed this year and uh, we have got funding from TBOT and uh, TBOT grants and ODOT grants and TBOT uh, matching funds and a lot of local uh, matching funds. Okay. So the last the main, uh, major barriers, so overcome a lot, uh, I mean, for low incomes and new immigrants in that area, they're concerned about like how expensive use that transit. Uh, uh, and that's uh, we will like uh, upon them to raise credit for cohort participants and uh, to we tell one uh, one on one to support their use the app and overcome the cultural device by desired cohort-based program without uh, uh, like a lot of workshop to learning and support and, uh, and different language and uh, a lot of, like cultural barriers and uh, safety concepts and safety for the safety. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Looking forward to the tour in yeah, two weeks. Oh, yeah, she's playing the tour. Yes. Oh, she has the tour. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
Uh, PSU student, also my co-worker, Roninger, uh, she created a map. Uh, it's a really wonderful map and have including a lot of uh, space, business, in, so uh, a lot of odd things and including, and yeah, I will like tour in the future. Great. Hi, everyone. I'm Stephanie Lonsdale, and I thought this was a great opportunity to talk to everyone about something that I get really excited about, um, and maybe talk to some of you, but we'll see. Um, so a little background, back in 2015, Portland adopted um, the Climate Action Plan and set goals for reduce emissions um, with some major benchmarks. Uh, updated graphs would show that we're not on the ideal trajectory, so there are things that we ideally would do or change to um, really increase our emissions reduction. Uh, about 42% of Portland emissions come from the transportation sector. Uh, in order to further our climate action goals and stay on target, we need to work, uh, we need to like achieve our mode split, um, but not, not all trips can be made by bike or by walking or by transit. So knowing that some people are going to need to drive, um, there are, there's an opportunity to electrify some of those vehicle trips and reduce vehicle miles traveled on the roadway. But unfortunately, electric vehicles are not available to everyone. Um, uh, PGE did a, they do an annual study, and last year's report uh, indicated that about 99% of Portland's EV owners are charging at home. Um, if someone lives in an apartment, there's not the same opportunity to plug into your garage, and it's not that common for uh, parking structures or electric or for multi-family housing to have EV charging. So, and I don't know if you guys, there's, Show of hands, who's seen like a public electric vehicle charger around town? That's a few, that's more than I thought. But they're not, they're not that prevalent. And sometimes the ones at gas stations don't work or they don't have the correct hookup. So there's just a gap that needs to be addressed. Um, so we need better access to EV charging. And I thought, let's put an equity lens on it. Because I'm scared of putting a bird on it. <laughs> uh, so I want to focus on multifamily housing and just kind of briefly overview couple of options or alternatives um, as to how we could make multifamily charging, charging at multifamily structures more accessible. So one way is to update code BPS to include EV charging in your parking. Um, this would be great for future uh, multifamily housing, but it wouldn't necessarily meet the needs of people who are already living in multifamily housing. Um, I, I don't know if I'll go into the details here. Um, oh, I will actually, I will mention, um, there, there's a fairly substantial barrier of who would own and maintain the charters. So if there were to be charters to go in, uh, in a multifamily uh, unit or in a multifamily structure, uh, we should assume that it would take a third party um, company to operate it wouldn't necessarily be like a lot of PGE. Another idea is to create a utility pool charger request program. Um, as streetlights are being updated, uh, they have some of them have the capacity to uh, for you to plug your vehicle into it. Um, I haven't seen them around Portland, but LA, there's some really cool stuff happening in LA um, deploying chargers on light poles. Um, the problem with the request program would be not everyone has access to it. Uh, the people who maybe already own cars would be really excited about it, but the people who are working till 7 p.m. or working overnight, they may not be like cruising the like, city website, like, what can I get from Pot today? So it would just leave out some people. Uh, another idea is um, putting utility pole chargers adjacent to multifamily units. Um, and this would this would give us give the city a chance to um, do it proactively versus reactively and identify places where the grid could handle utility pole chargers. Um, and there are there's a lot of nuance within this. I'll admit. Um, talking with PGE, there are some poles that 
can't be updated. So taking an approach to identify where possible locations could be and where those are next to multifamily housing um, is a great opportunity to to kind of avoid the avoid the barriers by starting out with your initial framework. Okay. Uh, Another would be um, citing pedestals. Those are different. Those are more like the third party chargers that you see that might be like shoulder height. Um, they would require, again, third party to own and operate those. Um, but it would be a chance to partner with third, with um, multifamily housing that maybe didn't have uh, utility poles that were um, eligible for utility. Um, all of this totally depends on public outreach. Um, you, it's, we've had bad results in delivering things that people don't necessarily want, um, or they don't feel like they had a say in where it was put or if they would use it. So all of this totally depends. The linchpin is community outreach. And fortunately, I know the city has a ton of partnerships with affordable housing. So there's a great way to do it to use the connection. Um, also education, other than charging availability, education is a huge barrier to EV ownership. A lot of people don't know about electric vehicles or like, how long they take to charge, how long the new models range is. So another component of this, this community-based organization and outreach should really also be education. Um, my preferred alternative very quickly is um, citing the utility pole charger because you in that case, you may not need a third party company to come in. There's not really an appetite for it, at least in so far. Um, again, there's nuances with whether or not the utilities would want to um, own and operate the infrastructure. Um, and I just quickly wanted to show this is my neighborhood. This is Rose City Park, roughly here. Um, my map is missing some of the streets, so sorry you may not be able to orient yourselves as well. Um, but the, the darker the colors that you're seeing, the higher equity score uh, they have. And this is an area right around um, Sandy in, in the 40s. And there's a ton of multifamily housing, uh, <clears throat> 70 in many of those locations. And this is a map that BPS created uh, that I borrowed some information from. Um, but there's, there's great opportunity to provide charging in places that have high equity scores and have a lot of multi-family housing. How much space is taken up for the utility poles that would take away from pedestrian thoroughfare? Would they get in the way for uh, usability, wheelchairs, access? I'm no expert, but from what I've seen, um, many times the utility holder are sited fairly close to the edge of the curb. Um, but I can't speak for all of the utility holders. There are court, Seattle um, is doing court cover programs. That's more for people that are charging, um, that maybe they, they have their own home and they can just want to pour it out, but they may not have it directly in the garage. So court covers are a cheap way to um, be ADA accessible, and they're similar to the things that you see at concerts whenever you're like walking over. What's average price of an electric car these days? I have no idea. Electric car? There's a ton of rebates, but I just check it out because you can get a lot of that. Yeah, it's amazing. Quickly, one or two more yeah, I was just going to a quick comment. I was going to say, like, I, I really like your idea. I think um, the city and private companies need to make e cars more more affordable, and then also build the awareness and educate about all the rebates because there is a lot of there's, rebates. So there's um, the fourth showcase is at PPE. Have you guys been there at all? Yeah. <laughs> yes. You guys familiar with the course showcase right yeah. on PGE? Okay. They will tell you, um, they're not there to sell you a car, but they'll tell you how to use uh, different types of cars. Well, they'll show you different options for cars and different options for charging, and um, you can even drive around and check it out. Tell you it? It's called the fourth, 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 the fourth like showcase. school fourth. Oh, okay. <laughs> the fourth. Um, their showcase is right across from PG. I think it's on third, 10th or third. And they have a link. 
Uh, in most of my slides, I had links to whatever I was referencing in the notes section. I think I had a link for fourth round. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, so I switched my project in a way about a month ago. So I didn't have much time, but I switched because I heard about Mark. Um, Mark is a street roots vendor, um, 64 years old, and he was on the, he took the 20 bus downtown. Um, he had purchased his, his health card, a, an honored citizen card. Um, he went to street roots and picked up his papers and um, then got on the max at the uh, Old Town Chinatown station. And he was, uh, Stopped by the China police and uh, cited on his own dollars because he didn't swipe outside um, because he had thought that he had already earned his month pass, which was twenty eight dollars on the health card. Um, and Charmette's response was, "It's unfortunate that Mr. Rodriguez misunderstood how the health card works, and as a result, was cited." Which I thought was a little, at least, insensitive. Um, yeah. So. Um, and I, I reached out to Street Roots. I know the, the vendor coordinator is upon Palancy. I met Mark. Um, and then I was talking to Flea, and we had actually come with our honor of Garcia, um, who is a very one year old mother of two, um, and the executive director of Color Pack. Um, and in 2018, she was riding uh, TriMet. She got off at the Old Town Chinatown station. Um, and the TriMet officers asked her for her pass, but she had um, forgotten at home. Um, and she said she was willing to pay, uh, take the citation. And when they asked her her name, she gave her, her name up on it, so let's go. But her birth name is Rosa Belgorama. Um, and the name for her is a reminder of the dark time in her, her early childhood. And she doesn't use her, her birth name. Um, and the board of police, um, they, they took her in for, for lying, um, for not giving her ID, um, and they charged her, uh, they, they held her overnight, and they charged her for theft from third degree of services and furnishing false information to the police. Um, they did remove that false information um, charge, but they still held her overnight. Um, and yeah, just kind of. Um, yeah, so I, uh, my idea is that we want to like to advocate for uh, public transit networks for all that is still in mind. But, um, but so how it works now is TriMet kind of has leeway to decide who and who not to enforce uh, the, the fair um, enforcement for people who don't ride so that they see the people in bags who are on the airport. Um, but I think that this opens up a lot of opportunity for kind of unconscious or subconscious bias um, with the, the police officers. So, um, and I, I took these uh, guidelines from the Chicago uh, Civilian Office of Police Accountability um, after I had an interview with Frank Chapman um, of Chicago, who was wrongfully committed of murder and armed robbery. And was incarcerated for 14 years. Um, but this committee would provide a just and efficient means to fairly and timely conduct investigations, um, determine whether allegations of police misconduct are well founded, identify and uh, address patterns of police misconduct, then make policy recommendations to improve uh, the police department. So that's my idea. And then kind of what can be done at the local level to make this and support candidates who are for more fair and equitable public transit. Um, support TriMet moving under Metro's jurisdiction to better serve the region's values because it's, it's operated at the state level right now, um, which is kind of weird because it went. Um, and then state, and then through the state, it's for public goods. Question for Andrew? Yeah. Is there a policy of a warning on a first offense, uh, assuming you're calling it an offense, but 
for the first contact. Um, no. It's yeah, it's up to the general discussion, but it's that discussion. So all of their ticketing uh, data is tracked. Yeah. And since they are a publicly funded, they are held they are held to account for it. They're, it's not like they're unaccountable. It's just what they do with that information has been sort of lacking lately. Yeah. The question I always have about this is what, what if we just stopped enforcing? Yeah. Like don't stop billing, but you don't even have to tell anyone particularly, just like stop enforcing. For sure. Like I, I did, what would happen? Yeah. No, I, I definitely believe in that case for that. Um, but yeah, I don't think it's kind of hard to just kind of say, like, but I totally agree. Like, based on the honor system. Oh, I just wanted to add that um, Seattle has a pretty cool enforcement program. They kind of changed the way they look at um, with the enforced fair, so they consider it a customer service opportunity mm -hmm. as opposed to an enforcement opportunity. So their initial goal is to figure out why that person didn't, you know, either tap their card or have money on their card, and they their goal is to solve that problem first. And then there's other levels of enforcement. But that's their kind of primary approach to it, and it's been pretty cool. I would love to use that. Kind of. I think it's a great approach. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, wait. Andrews and Andy's are there. <laughs> popular. It's very popular. I went for Faith and Ryan. I want to give it a disclaimer before I start, before I start the timer. This is weird and fake and doesn't have a satisfying conclusion. It turned into a research project and it hasn't quite taken its final form yet. I will probably turn it into a piece of writing or video or something. I think it's five days ago. Well, three hours. Yeah. 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 I'm just going to talk about it for I mean, a cut off. Okay, so, so I, I will have to cut you off because yeah. I want to get through all the presentations and I do want to get close to it. Okay, I wanted to take this opportunity to look into Cardigo and uh, the current state of car sharing in Portland. And I specifically wanted to answer these questions. Why did Cardigo <laughs> shut down operations in Portland? What will the impact be now that they're gone? What should replace it and what will replace it? Um, so Cardigo launched here in 2012. It's free floating car share, which is different from round trip um, docked car share like Zipcar, or peer to peer, which is where you're renting a car from a person, a private person who owns one. They have 60,000 customers in Portland, which is a lot, but they also have 100, uh, 137,000 in Seattle, and they maintained a fleet of 450 vehicles. Cargo is owned by Daimler, who owned BMW and Smart, which is why they used Smart Cars originally and then switched to the BMWs. Um, and then they merged with BMW, 13 other mobility companies, and uh, created a whole other project called FreeNow. If you got confused by the Cardigo, ShareNow, ReachNow, FreeNow thing, I figured out what it all was. <laughs> so you can talk to me about that afterwards. <laughs> um, I totally took a lot of time. Okay. Why did they shut down operations in Portland? They put out some kind of roundabout <coughs> bullshit PR statement that didn't really say why. The actual answer is that they're owned by an auto manufacturer and most major auto are, most of the um, car sharing companies are subsidiaries of auto manufacturers primarily. And the automotive industry is sort of panicking at the moment because there are major threats to their primary business model, which is selling cars because people are not buying cars as much. Uh, so mobility, looking into like other ways that they can use the thing that they have, which is cars, autonomy and autonomous vehicles and developing autonomous vehicles and electrification. And basically, they're pulling out of focusing on mobility to focus on autonomy and electrification because autonomy and electrification are going to be regulated. And they're freaking out about it. There will be laws and regulations around autonomy and electrification. So they, while a lot of these companies, big car companies, bought car sharing companies, maybe with the best of intentions, they're shutting them down as they now start to focus on the things that they're actually worried about. Um, Cardigo left Portland, Austin, Calgary, and Denver in uh, October, and they're leaving Chicago in December. Basically, growth had leveled off or did not show potential for a lot of future growth, so they were immediate candidates to be struck from uh, service areas. What will the impact be now that they're gone? Uh, more cars. We are going to have a lot more people buying or leasing cars. Um, they, this report was put out in 2016. There was admittedly 
maybe sponsored or at least uh, trying to go work on conspirator and, and help them produce this report that came out of Berkeley um, that found that for every individual cargo vehicle on the road, it removes somewhere between 7 and 11 private vehicles from the roads of the city that they researched through these five cities. Every cargo vehicle removed remove between 10 and 14 metric tons of greenhouse, greenhouse gas, the actual individual cars, and somewhere between 6,500 and 10,000 metric tons of greenhouse gases per year, uh, polluting the air of the cities that they researched. Um, in addition, they were newer cars, so the cars that they were removing from private use were, I'm gonna try to go very quickly, uh, were older cars, so they were better, more fuel efficient cars. What should replace it? Probably not something run by a private company. The problem with this is that car to go and car sharing kind of muddies, so they were sort of providing a public service because the city, and especially Portland, like we have all of these goals towards reducing private car ownership and emissions, and Cardigo was doing that, but they are a private company. They're not necessarily motivated to do that. They are, their one and only motivation is to maximize profit for shareholders because they're a corporation. What should replace it? Probably something more progressive than a corporate, something led by a corporation and can be at the whims of that cor corporation shareholders. Um, I am currently in the process of going through every single car sharing company in the world. <laughs> To try to figure out how many cars they have, some of them are, are defunct or have emerged, and so this has become a whole thing for me. Um, what will replace it, unfortunately? Probably nothing right now. Most of the major car, uh, the car sharing projects that exist um, as subsidiaries of auto manufacturers are downsizing or are leaving cities, they're not growing. Um, Probably nothing. Car sharing schemes are very expensive. Starting them is very expensive. There's a lot of reluctance in venture capital circles to invest in stuff like this because it's, it's unknown because the market is sort of pulling back on these projects. Trying to start, like I originally had approached this from like, what would it look like to start one here as a small business? What would it look like to encourage Peabot or Trimet to try to spin something like this out? Like it has such a incredible and immediate uh, impact to traffic and congestion in the environment like it makes sense for this to exist like it should exist but they're incredibly expensive the reason why they're run by auto manufacturers is that one of the most expensive parts of operating a car sharing company is cars they can get the cars for basically nothing um, so there are other groups that are looking into this you have to think about businesses that depend on car ownership so dealership networks and scoop group are in bc piloting a project called Penske Dash, which might expand or might not, who knows. Automotive associations, obviously, as people are driving less, um, you'll, they're becoming irrelevant, so they're starting to get into it. AAA has a project in California, Northern California, called Gig Car Share. Basically, I don't think that we should be waiting for private companies to solve this problem for us, but I don't quite know how to encourage an entity like Peabot or Trinet to get into doing this either. Jim, you might know. I, I, yes, yeah. <laughs> I do not have a, a clear solution uh, to this problem yet, but it was a really good opportunity to interview a ton of people and to get a lot of information and to make some really beautiful spreadsheets. So I am now incredibly knowledgeable about the business operations of Cardigo, particularly in Portland and a little bit in Seattle. Seven more and people have to go. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, yeah in, I'm going with in it. Ten um, so if anyone wants to talk to me about yeah. this afterwards, this is another thing I really okay. enjoy talking about. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I think this class has to be a three hour class. I can't do two hour classes like this. <laughs> oh, thanks. Really good. We go for drinks. I want to see where Okay, we have. <laughs> go for it. Yeah, but... I've had a blast. Are you? <laughs> I am too. <laughs> um, Sarah, can you? Well, you can just talk for three minutes. <laughs> Do you want to have somebody else go and pull up and fill up the message? Do you want to resend it and we can have the next presenter? Yeah. yeah. Um, All right. Makes sense. No. Rob. Rob.
Yeah. 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 So uh, this is uh, the Pearl District where I work, and I'm right off of that the Northwest 13th Avenue. It's two blocks from Howell's Brooks. Uh, I'm mostly between um, Davis and and um, Everett. And basically, in the old days, this was the old industrial district. So what you have up and down this street is not sidewalks, but uh, loading docks. It's a loading dock street. And my proposal is simply to just make it a walkable street, remove the cars. Um, often, there's a lot of bars. There's a lot of restaurants. Uh, there's different um, uh, shops. And I'd love to see them still out into the street and become a pedestrianized, uh, walkable boulevard, a promenade, mm -hmm. I think is the appropriate word. I, I just took some screen grabs from uh, Google. I want to point out here we have uh, someone uh, with a walking disability, um, a cane. Forgive me, I'm trying to figure this one out. Okay. There it is. Uh, see, uh, this is this is what it feels like to, to walk on this street on the daily to get to lunches or to meetings at another shop. Um, this is the kind of space that you have between your cars when you're walking. Uh, and this is uh, my proposal. Is symbolic. Um, Everybody cars first, right? What's that? You ready to start? Yeah, I did. Trap them in there. Yeah. I tried to put the, the ball in, but I couldn't throw it. Yeah, exactly. No, I did a great job. That's the far distance. Um, and then uh, the last thing uh, there, it, there's a, I had two screen grabs in my folder uh, that were separate from this video. It was, it was, oh, any hey, one of the two that were like PNG, not PNG. And just to demonstrate one of the parking areas. In the, and that, that's basically that is, is the, um, the best mm -hmm. No, you're it later. Oh, yeah, thanks, Mark. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, bring up. Um, nice well, job being succinct. Yeah. That was excellent. What do you want to extend that? I'd start with one and then I'd keep pushing it until it's tiny. Show me the five. Get a lot of business yeah, of course, for yeah once, like in honesty I think when once businesses see how one street does and the bars can still out and it's and tabling and sitting and walking <laughs> I think it would be very attractive to the next what? block and so on and so on okay sorry Bob, yes cool. down, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> both of you <laughs> So I was going to do a big overarching project of electric ferries on the Willamette, and then Woo! decided that this was actually going on right now in my neighborhood, so I changed it to the 60th and Halsey Improvement Project. Uh, it's my neighborhood. This is the scope of the area. The transportation issues are directly related to walking, biking, and transit. Currently, 60th and Halsey is a car project. Probably eight out of nine million dollars I got to spend is all going towards cars. Uh, it is a high crash corridor. There's not enough multimodal within it, and it needs to address access for walking, biking, and transit. Currently, outer housing looks like this, which is fantastic. Just got implemented. Looks great. Very soon, the middle seventies is going to do the same thing, coming right down to my neighborhood at 60th and Halsey, which does none of this. Uh, walking needs improved sidewalk width and improved crosswalk, which to Peabot's uh, credit, they are doing. Access to transit stops, shorty crossing distance, improved visibility, and specifically equity benefit for people with disabilities for the final tour sections, it's not. Biking, 
needs access to destinations. It has great bikeways uh, and greenways, but they don't go anywhere. It needs to close the network gaps and complete the network. I'll address that more in a moment. Transit needs better access to stops and stations, direct boarding from the transit lane so that the buses don't have to pull over, get stuck with cars going by them, and can never get out and have accessible stops because right now you can barely fit a wheelchair on the sidewalk, let alone actually get a lower ramp and get the wheelchair onto the bus. Specifically, Metro Complete Streets did a survey of the area and from the map that Andrew had. This area has a higher than city average of low income, non white people with disabilities and youth. Specifically, state use of funds says that when an area is reconstructed, which is basically what this is, Rule 12 requires that they accept, they support a variety of transportation modes so residents are not living in the way that they can access. City use of funds specifically says that they are walking, biking, transit, and all the way at the bottom is single occupancy vehicles. The street policy specifically is a city bikeway, it's a city walkway, it's a transit access street. Current plan, which was updated from two travel lanes and two lanes of car storage, now at least got rid of the car storage, but now it's three travel lanes because it's two driving lanes and two left turn lanes through the whole section. It really should just be two driving lanes and two sets of bike lanes. This could expand and allow for better planning strips and better sidewalks for mobility and access. Again, you get better sight lines, better safety, better pedestrian crossings, better bicycle access, and better transit access. The project area's current bike facilities is this, and you'll notice right here, it all dies. This right here does not exist. That's a lot. <laughs> Even though Google Maps will tell you that it is. That's 60th, and that's where there should be a bike lane. No problem. Be done in 60 seconds. This is the current greenway. It looks ridiculous. You want a bike on that? There are no improvements going to be done to that road. This is the proposed bike lane that goes up to the 60th Avenue Max Station, which is great, but only goes two blocks. It really should look like this for the entirety of 60th, down to where all the businesses go, because that's where you need the access, not on the greenway over on 62nd, where all the homes are. 52nd. Right now, with those three, with the turn lanes, it's going to put left turn lanes onto a green lane. So you're going to increase car traffic onto the 53rd Greenway, and that's one of the primary north-south accesses to get over I-84 because that's where there's <coughs> the rest of the rest of Halsey should look like this. It should go all the way down to 46 and 48. It should go all the way down to 47th and 42nd, so that it actually accesses Hollywood and all of the neighborhood business communities. We just keep my minimalist slides. Uh, I only have four of them, uh, so oh, thank I you. too much time. <laughs> uh, yeah, my project's 35 by 35, and the goal is to. Um, have a 35% work from home mode share by 2035. Um, and this project really kind of came to mind when I read that Commissioner uh, Daly had said that you know, if we're going to hit our 2035 emission goals, we need to have a 50% reduction in vehicle miles traveled. And so what's the low hanging fruit? You know, for a lot of people who are commuting to work, who have the opportunity to potentially work remotely, eliminating a car commute, could definitely help with that. Um, but I think, you know, in addition to the environmental reasons for potentially pushing this mode trick route, um, my suspicion um, is that most of the 9% of port members who are currently taking advantage of remote working are probably pretty privileged port members. And I think that if the city were to aggressively promote and advocate for the home, I think that more people that might not have that opportunity could take advantage of it. Um, just right off the bat, I'm going to acknowledge no, I know not everybody can work from home. Um, I also want to acknowledge that working from home doesn't have to be five days a week. You know, maybe it's one day a week, maybe it's two days a week. So um, the case for telecommuting, um, we talked a little bit about the environmental goals. I think the other thing is just, again, this is a benefit that a lot of people on 
and shortly after our survey, really appreciate this having the opportunity to have some flexible um, opportunities to do day to day to work from home. Um, I think, you know, another thing to really think about is this is the more people that are working from home, the less people are on the road and folks that have to drive to work. Uh, and I think that, you know, this is an opportunity to be a win-win for folks who get the chance to take advantage of working remotely occasionally, and also for the folks who can do that, but still have to be on the road. Um, I think uh, another big thing that just in my mind makes a ton of sense is this is show ready, guys. This is super cheap. You don't have to spend a lot of money to make this happen. Um, and the good news is, is it's already happening. Um, it's the, already the third highest mode share currently right now. Um, it's doubled in uh, the last 10 years, which is pretty exciting, and it's happening organically. Um, so just a few other things I'll share. Uh, people love it. You know, it's consistently rated the you know, number one benefit that folks want or have. Um, and uh, a few other things. Obviously, if you're not in your car commuting, you're saving money. Also, if you're not in your car commuting, you're very safe. The safest trip you can take is the one that's not taken, right? Um, and I think the big thing for me that, like, really, I think, is a big opportunity for Peabot is it gives Peabot an opportunity to take a little bit of ownership of a mode share growth that's growing organically currently. You know, what if the city of Portland said, hey, let's become the remote work capital of the United States and let's get it up to 35% and they can start taking credit for something that's already happening. Um, so this is my cool little one graph, right? So 10 years ago, 2009, remote work 5.9 per six. Again, with no real promotion from the city, it's currently 10 years later at just under 10%. If you know we just did nothing, it's going to hit 23.2% if it continues to grow as it has recently. So 35%, I don't think, is a huge stretch if the city got behind it. So last couple of things, I think what this could look like um, is, you know, obviously one, you know, people are aggressively, you know, advocating for a higher mode share growth. Right now, my understanding is. Their mode share for the 2035 is 10% work from home. We're already there. You know, why not stretch it? A um, few other things. Uh, I would just say the city of Portland does have a telecommuting policy. Every girl, in my understanding, has that option to you know roll out on their own. I think a big area for PBOT would be to walk the work from home walk. You know, my understanding is that you have to get your manager's approval, which I totally get and understand, but for some people that don't see their managers taking advantage of it, who's going to take advantage of it if they want to move up, if they're not seeing leadership do it, right? So um, the last thing I'll say is uh, we could potentially pass this report directive. Seattle has a cool program. It's called the Trip Reduction Program, where they actually talk to businesses and talk to them specifically about how are you going to remove people from driving to work. Um, so anyways, 35 for 35. Thank you, nice. Have a quick thing you, that you could show Tristan. follow up on the broadband internet, which is uh, over time. So I I'll just call you to see after uh, go fire. Okay. Okay. Um. Well, well, well. Let's go. Let's. Have you go first? Are we going to load your up? Yeah, can you tell Sarah? And can we go? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, my idea is a diagonal crossing. Uh, it's on the way here. If anyone bikes from Southeast Portland coming over to Hilton Bridge, from the PSU, you probably go uh, past Harbor Drive and River Parkway, where Harrison begins and the streetcar rides. Uh, this is aerial view. Um, so my idea is uh, right now this is the expected maneuver for cyclists, and you have to. Uh, this is often a green light, and you wait here on the island for this red light to turn green, so that you can wait again for another green light to cross here, and then go up the steep hill, and I'll almost always I'll wait another red light. Um, so yes, my idea is the uh, diagonal crossing here. This is just a sign showing the maneuver you're expected to do. And then uh, just street level view of the intersection. Uh, 
if you activate that second screen, you can see here. This is a this is through the lights. Like this is often green. Um, oh, shout out to um, whoever at Peabot changed that because it didn't used to be that way. When it was first implemented, it was almost always red. Yeah. So. Uh, to get to the island. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, often that heat's an island and away for the green line to cross River Parkway. Um, so this is two other intersections that demonstrate diagonal crosses in Portland. This is um, two places where the bike paths don't follow the, the grade. So I think um, it's already been demonstrated that it works. So here we got the Springwater Corridor by Johnson Creek and Bell Avenue in Southeast. And then over here is uh, Northeast Oregon Lloyd. When we're getting down to the F1 hot. Uh, that's it. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, the diagonal crossing over the light rail tracks themselves a challenge as far as safety for cyclists. Getting over. Um, no, I think it's a. No, I think that the um, <coughs> the angle is up for the Good question. Uh, oh yeah, I, I talked to Richard Gill at Peabot and. Uh, he said it cost maybe like fifty, sixty thousand dollars, and one of the biggest problems is that it's like one hundred and twenty feet, so it'd be a long stop for both directions of the traffic. Yeah. Um, everybody, thanks, Tristan. Um, Tristan, you talked to you about a little pet project of mine that um, you know, for now I'm just going to refer to it as the Gateway Arch. So I live in Madison South, um, and it's a neighborhood that's. Uh, like halfway, technically, East Portland, halfway on the other side of Eastern Avenue. Um, and it exists in kind of a weird little pocket, uh, slightly isolated from the rest of the city. It's like on one side, you got East 2nd Avenue, you got I 84, you got 205. Um, so it's a little bit um, inaccessible. Um, so it's not very walkable. There aren't a lot of, there's not like a shopping district, there are no grocery stores nearby. Um, and so the solution to that, in my mind, is a a new pedestrian and cycling transit bridge that would cross over um, oops, and, um, <coughs> a new uh, pedestrian bicycle bridge that would cross over Interstate 84 205, um, roughly in the vicinity of Broadway, Weisberg Streets, and it connecting that to the south to uh, other neighborhoods in Portland and also to. Amenities uh, and services, the Gateway Travel Center, as well as the Gateway Green Bike Park, and the I-205. So this is the uh, uh, you know, I just want to be This is a overview of the project area. Um, Broadways around here is kind of hard to see. This is Wheeler, and basically, uh, this is the same photo with GIS overlaid, and that's a potential alignment for the bridge. Um, and it would basically look kind of like this one here. This is, I think, the Gibbs Street Bridge, uh, south of Portland in the background. Um, this is like the, a rendering of the Earl Blumenauer pedestrian and uh, bicycle bridge that's been proposed. Um, so the goal of the neighborhoods are uh, separated by freeway construction. Improve the walkability of masses south of the park neighborhoods, uh, reduce single occupant vehicle trips along Halsey Street, but uh, connect masses south to otherwise access businesses and amenities, and also to provide a place for this a connector for emergency transportation. And the considerations um, I actually got this list from the really useful document from 2007 uh, that like highlights a whole lot of. Uh, pedestrian and bicycle projects in the city, but purpose and function, so what I've been before, and then also other considerations like the surrounding pedestrian and bicycle network is actually uh, one of my, in that side on the board, and one of my fellow board members is the owner of a uh, like mountain bike, uh, like cycle cross course in the neighborhood, so the next lumber yard. Um, and so there's a lot of like support, and like Gateway Green is nearby, that we'll be soon. So there's kind of a lot of support for like bicycle oriented infrastructure. Um, the, alternative the only alternative crossing to get to like Fred Meyer and Gateway Shopping Center is Halsey Street, which is um, it's just like a really steep 
uh, Carl New Bridge. It's really hard to bike up. There's only one sidewalk <laughs> on the north side. Bridge um, <coughs> bridge access is like sort of the most difficult thing to kind of figure out because to get like as much buy-in as possible, you want to like make it as attractive as many different uh, agencies or groups. So like in addition to making it a pedestrian bicycle bridge, you want to also make it accessible to emergency vehicles so that that can factor into design where you have to make it wide enough and uh, have a shallow enough grade. Um, yeah, and uh, there's like element aesthetics, uh, maintenance, etc. And that's about it. Any questions? Yeah, and I think we're working on a project um, that connects the, the red line there. So yeah, we can we can we'll talk. We'll talk to Liz Phillips over in our office. Oh, so another one on the Tristan Red Jam. Thank you. Thank you. We went over time. Oh, but of course, yes. Thanks, Jim. Really, before we break out, I just this was so super fun. I learned a ton. <laughs> I'm serious. I loved it. You want to take it again? I was like, this whole presentation is great. I learned a whole lot, and I refused to score because they were all fantastic. It was just too hard. Um, and this is where Director Warner needs to plug his ears. But if any of you want to follow up your presentation with a little direct lobbying experience, um, especially for those who didn't get to finish the presentation, my door is open to all of you. I'm happy if you want to reach out to me on official, um, my official contacts and we'll set up a meeting. I would just love to talk more about some of your projects. So thank you very much. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. I'm sorry. Through. The nature of the work, right? Well, two hours to do. <laughs>